Three, two, one. Ignorance is dangerous. What's even more dangerous is being ignorant of your own ignorance. I, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with intuition. There are those warning signals that you get, and you can't always explain them. I also know that there are times when our intuition leads us astray. The narcissism of small differences, right? That if, if you were to actually take a step back, <laughs> you're like cutting off your nose to spite your own face. Nope, these people are not exactly consistent with my principles, therefore I can't ally with them. Adam Grant is one of my heroes. He's an author, organizational psychologist, the top-rated professor at Wharton School of Business, and not only a TED speaker, but also a TED podcaster. He has a TED podcast called Work Life. I first learned about Adam Grant in a Boston bookstore where the cover of his book, The Originals, How Nonconformists Move the World, caught my eye. It's a white book with bright colored paint splatter. I still don't know what the art meant, but as someone who in that moment judged a book by its cover, I knew I needed to read it. And by read it, I mean I devoured it. I've gifted this book dozens and dozens and dozens of times and still continue to. The originals is where I learned about the concept of horizontal hostility, which if you know me, you've heard me mention it at least once. His latest book, Think Again, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know, could not be more timely. And we get into all of it, how we quote, think, how we change our minds, what intuition actually is, and if it is always good. Horizontal hostility, of course, doing work you need for yourself, doing work you actually need for your own self, and so much more. This is one of my favorite podcast episodes and one of my favorite conversations I've ever had. So I hope you enjoy every single minute of it. Welcome, welcome to our guided storytelling session, Adam. I told you this in our pre-call that I'm a huge fan and just constantly inspired by you. So again, I'm going to say thank you so much for teaching us and giving us so many tools and the language that we need to build our team and to build our business and just our core values and principles and all those cool things. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Noor. I really appreciate that. I will try to live up to it. And <laughs> thank you for, for giving voice to the stories of so many marginalized people. I'm not sure what I'm doing here, but I'm glad to be here. You're here today because I love reading your stories and now I want to hear more of your stories. I get to hear some of them on your podcast, but hopefully we're going to get a little deeper today. I like to get started by asking you and just doing a little check-in. How is your heart today? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't, uh, I haven't tested my pulse or anything like that, so I couldn't <laughs> tell you. Uh, I would say overall good. I think there, it's, it's obviously been an incredibly hard year for so many people, and I feel very fortunate that I have nothing major to complain about. How about you? My heart is, it's a little anxious, I will say, but I think I've just kind of been anxious lately in general, and I'm figuring out the reasons behind that. I'm doing things to alleviate it, and I'm spending time outside. I just went, took a little swim in our pond, which was really lovely, and it cleared my head. And I also have been spending time in the, you know, what, 60-degree weather right now? I'm just loving it. That's good to hear. Yeah, you yeah. can't invite a fellow podcast host on your show and expect to ask all the questions. Watch out. I know. And that's like, you know, it's kind of hard because this is really supposed to be about your guided storytelling and, and just hearing your insides come out. But it just becomes this double interview, which I think is really great for all of the listeners. And they're really grateful for it. But then I just get surprised, which I shouldn't be. And I'm so grateful for it. So thank you for asking me about my heart. Thank you for also writing something during this time that is really helpful to so many people. Did you actually write your latest book, Think Again, during COVID, or were you already working on that? You already knew we were going to need it. No, it was a complete accident. I've always tried to write books that were timeless, and I made the mistake of writing one that was also <laughs> timely this time. I had no idea. I started working on it in 2018 after too many experiences of being frustrated that other people wouldn't open their minds, and then 
sometimes discovering that I was the one who needed to open my mind and Whoa. think again. Wow. So I, um, I started working on the book and then I was, I think I had finished about two thirds of it when the pandemic started and I realized there was a bunch of rethinking and a bunch of rewriting that I needed to do. Did you feel like you just completely rewrote it or do you feel like a lot of it held up? I think most of it held up because I was interested in the general psychology of you know, what, what stops us from questioning our opinions and our assumptions and mm. what stops other people from doing that too and, and how do we change those dynamics? And I think it, you know, the, the psychology holds, right? The, some of the examples change. I think some of, also some of the questions that I started asking were different from ones that I, I really thought I was going to get into, uh, into. I guess a good example would be, um, I, was, I really thought the whole book was going to be about getting people to, you know, to rethink their own views. And I normally think about opinions as something you hold consciously. And what COVID really brought to the fore was, how many assumptions we were clinging to that we didn't even know we had in the first place. Like, it never occurred to me to question the assumption that it was safe to hug extended family or that it was safe to eat indoor in a restaurant. Uh, and I think that, that made me much more aware of the fact that some of the most important rethinking that we do has to do with things that we don't even know we have thoughts about to begin with. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and, and it oftentimes takes other people kind of pointing them out in, this, in, the, in the way that you have over and over again in your books to really give us the language to talk about the thing that we're already experiencing. And think again, the subtitle is The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. And I felt that in a different, in a way that I didn't really expect because usually when you say the power of something, you're talking about something magnificent, something great. The power of knowing what you don't know. And then you immediately take us to a vulnerable corner that people are very uncomfortable going to, which is admitting that they don't know something. And oftentimes, most people don't know how to admit that they don't know something. I actually was just having a conversation with my sister-in-law who was feeling a little um, down and insecure about not knowing certain things in her field right now. And I, I just said to her, you know, I think the bigger thing to do, the thing that people prefer you to do is to simply say that you don't know and ask questions because that shows that you're open to learning, that you're open to growing. And we want more of that. At least that's how we like to build our team. So what did you, what did you know about framing your title that way? And what did you need the reader to know before they opened the book? <laughs> I, I think you're spot on. I think ignorance is dangerous. What's even more dangerous is being ignorant of your own ignorance. And I wanted... I wanted to, to signal to people that if you, know, if you want to keep an open mind, if you want to, you know, to, to stay informed and keep learning, uh, that you have to be aware of all the gaps in your knowledge. And that's hard for a lot of people. Um, I think there are a lot of people who fail to realize a fundamental truth of life, which is the faster you are to admit when you're wrong, the faster you can move toward being right. And, you know, there I have so many people in my life who are, who, who seem to think that the longer they deny they're wrong, um, the longer they can fool themselves and everyone else and sort of hold on to the illusion of being right, as opposed to saying, all right, maybe I should update my thinking and try to get it right. Well, I think the idea of updating your thinking isn't even one that people really consider. We either consider you're wrong or you're right. There really isn't a growth or in-between. We joke around with this term like, oh, those people at work are still stuck in high school. There are people who are still stuck in high school. Like their internalized <laughs> selves are still their young teen childlike selves that haven't actually gotten a chance to heal or evolve, which, you know, that part of ourselves is actually a really great place to tap into once you've been able to heal it, once you've been able to work through things and once you've been able to evolve. So is it really that people are uninterested in evolving or they don't know that it's okay to, or I don't know, what was it that you kind of came up with? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, everything. The, is, is that an option on this quiz? Yeah, I'm, this I'm is taking it. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yes. Oh man. Uh, no, it's a combination. I think for some people it's, you know, it's just even having the courage to question their opinions internally, right? And say, okay, Maybe I was always wrong. Maybe I used to be right, and the world has changed, right? In, in my day job as an organizational psychologist, I see this all the time, right? When, when I watch the BlackBerry fall apart or Blockbuster or Kodak or Sears right. or Toys R Us go out of business, it's not that those people were never right. 
It's that they stuck, they, they stuck to their opinions for too long and the world changed around them and they didn't adapt with it. So for some of us, I think it's that. For others, it's recognizing that when you admit I was wrong or I don't know or I changed my mind, that doesn't reveal your insecurity. It actually signals that you're secure enough in your strengths to admit some of your weaknesses. And that showing, showing that kind of humility actually takes confidence, right? So it's a, it's a bit of a reframe for people to say, hey, you know what, the, the confidence to, to say what you don't know and to say how you've evolved is actually a, a, a very powerful way of living in the world because it both allows other people to respect your integrity and it allows you to keep growing and learning. Right, wow. So we're talking about you know how people are nervous about how they're going to be perceived or how other people are going to look at them, which unfortunately many of us are more focused on than how we even feel about ourselves. But part of me is also thinking about the fear of questioning your beliefs, beliefs that were taught to you by people that you trusted, whether they be your parents, your teachers, your religious leaders, whoever it is, and having that be shaken and having that really feel like a piece of this like building that's made of blocks that you've kind of, the whole Jenga thing is falling apart. That's what I'm trying to say. And that's kind of what people are feeling. So they're holding on to this thing and even, and I've had these really hard conversations with people before, like even when they know something doesn't make sense, they just know that if they question this belief, then they have to question everything else and they don't wanna go there. But that willful ignorance has them still harming other people with the way that they think and just the way that they vote or the way that they spend their money or whatever it may be. Yeah, it, it reminds me of, of, I thought, a brilliant insight from the psychologist George Kelly, who had a, just a completely eye-opening definition of hostility. He said that hostility is the anger and frustration that you feel when a belief that you already know deep down was false gets invalidated. And all of a sudden you have to grapple with the reality that the thing you, you secretly suspected was wrong is in fact wrong and you really don't want to acknowledge it. What is it that happens to our insides when you do start to begin to chip away at that acknowledgement and decide, okay, I have to move in this direction or I, I will have to stay here? Well, I think if you talk to neuroscientists, they'll tell you that, that a threat to your core beliefs um, is a great way to trigger the amygdala, which is the threat detection system, right? And exists to, in some ways, govern fight or flight. And, you know, a lot of times people will attack, other times they'll vigorously defend. And it, there, there's some work in neuroscience that says it's like being punched in the mind, uh, that you literally show a, a physiological pain response when, when somebody attacks one of your core beliefs, which... I think explains a lot of what's going on in our polarized world right now. Uh, I think though that there's there's a sense in which after you know after you respond that way, if you if you have the equanimity or the curiosity to pause and say, "Huh, that's interesting. Like, why did I get so upset? It's, it was just mm -hmm. it was just a comment that somebody made. It was just an observation. Um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have any implications for me. I can choose to ignore it." And yet I, I completely lost it. What's going on there? Um, as you start to unpack, okay, why is this belief part of my identity? Why is it central to my value system? You can, you can start to realize, you know what? Sometimes it's actually liberating to let go of those old ideas that are holding you back, especially to your point. If you, know, you grew up in some setting where uh, you were indoctrinated or brainwashed to believe particular things before you, you really thought about them on your own. And the, the experience of being able to, to independently say, okay, well, let me, let me evaluate the evidence. Let me look at the logic here and decide for myself. That's empowering for a lot of people. Mm. Do you remember when you began to think for yourself? <laughs> uh, it's, it's strange to think about not thinking for myself. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to think of whether there was there was a point where I had a conscious awareness of it. I think yeah. <laughs> I actually have a vivid memory of standing outside with uh two of my nursery school friends and going up I think we were on a deck um in the backyard and going up one step above them and saying, I'm three and a half. And 
they were still three. They hadn't turned three and a half yet. And I felt like it, it gave me some, you know, some authority to, to not only think differently from them, but also to maybe tell them what to do a little bit. <laughs> and it's the, fr- it's the first memory I have of, of having a mind of my own. Wow. I mean, I love that because, like I said, that version of you is so pure and still exists and still you cheers you on. Yeah, 100%. I totally think that our inner child still exists within us. I do morning pages, which is the practice that Julia Cameron um, writes about in The Artist's Way. And when I'm really stuck in a problem or in a creative rut or whatever it is, my go-to practice is to write to my younger self. I actually, mm. I will show you. This is I love that. what I keep on my little, my little screen. Oh, so cute. Look at all the hair. And three-year-old Noor. I know, right? She's so cute. And this is the little girl that I write to, and she has all of my answers. And I think it's because I've spent enough time, I mean, she just had, she had the imagination of the whole entire world. And I was lucky enough that my parents were so encouraging to her and made sure that, you know, she, I did every little thing that inspired us. They put a camera in my face since I was a little baby and they knew that this was something that I gravitated towards. So before society told me who I should be and what I should look like, I always go back to that because that was the purest version of myself, I think. And I'm, I'm trying to get back to the energy and the spirit that that version of me had and trying to peel away all of the layers that I, of muck, essentially, that I was, that I let attach to myself as I've grown older. What I think is so interesting about that is it stands in direct contrast to what psychologists normally recommend when, when we study mental time travel. So the idea is that, you know, so often when we make decisions or we form opinions. We we're too we're too stuck in you know in the immediate considerations of the moment, right? And the goal is to mm-hmm. step outside of those. And usually the recommendation is fast forward in time. Imagine your future self in twenty years. Will you regret this decision? Mm. Uh, you know what what do you think you'll wish you had paid more attention to? And the hope is then that you know that people are less less likely to get seduced by status when they choose a job or a career path. Um, that they're more likely to prioritize meaning in relationships if they think about what's really going to matter to them in the long run. You're going backward. You are going to a less, I mean, you're going to a less wise, right? Less intelligent version of yourself. And I think one of the things that's interesting about that is w- when you use the term purity, it, it reminded me of, of something that, that happened to me that I didn't expect to be a, a pivotal moment at all, but it was. Uh, so I, I was just about to launch my second book I guess this was 2016. And a friend called and she said, your launch is a couple days away. What are you doing to celebrate? And I said, nothing. Like, I'm a, I'm a writer. That's what we do. We write. <laughs> like, authors publish books. And she said, don't, don't you think this is a big milestone? You poured at least a year of your life into this, maybe more. And, you know, it's not like you write a book every day. This is, this is really something you should, you should mark and you should savor. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me that I had, I, I am terrible at enjoying success. Uh, whenever mm. I accomplish a goal, it takes about four minutes for me to then recalibrate, raise the bar, and then focus on next year's goal. And it, it hit me that I needed, just like you do, to get in touch with an earlier version of myself, um, a more naive um, and maybe um, a, a slightly, a, a version of myself that was less likely to to take a meaningful accomplishment for granted. And so what I ended up doing was I ended up rewinding to say, okay, if 10 years ago or five years ago, even I knew I was going to publish a second book, let alone a first one, that people were actually going to read it. That would have made my day. And I need to stay in touch with that earlier version of myself because it's going to allow me to appreciate those moments. And it's something I've done ever since. Whenever something meaningful happens that I'm tempted to just say, eh, nah, as expected, right? that's, that's a part of my life now. It's part of my identity. Um, I've tried to rewind the clock and say, okay, if I could get in touch with the, you know, the 10 year old or the 15 year old or the 20 year old year old version of myself, uh, how excited would I be? And then I have a responsibility to that version of me uh, to experience that, that level of joy for at least a day. Is that similar to how this plays out for you? Cause it, it sounds like when you write to your younger self, you're also doing it to live up to the the dreams, the goals of your younger self? I'm curious to hear more about that. 
Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And I also really relate to the just immediacy of I did the thing that I said I was going to do and it's over with and I have to move on and I have to move on. And I really, I think gratitude really plays a role in that for me now. My husband actually just said this yesterday. Are you grateful today for the things that you prayed for yesterday? And you don't have to be a praying person to acknowledge that you still have to sit in gratitude and mindfulness for the things that you've always dreamed of, that you've always asked for. For me, I think that especially because I'm on such a different path that's not traditional and not because I didn't want it to be traditional. I wanted the whole traditional route of being like working from a top 50 market, top 10 market to national news. That's what I wanted. That's what I thought I wanted. And because I, because that wasn't possible, because the no's were not because of my talent, but because of what I chose to wear, I had to figure out how to build differently. And that was, alhamdulillah, like that's the biggest gift I've ever been given because now you look at kind of the state of media and I'm realizing becoming my own media company, becoming my own media platform is what saved me and what saved my career. And of course I want to continue building, but I have to like remember that those little goals that I had because I've been setting goals for myself since I was three years old, like three and a half year old Adam and three year old Nuwoda would have been great friends because that's all (laughs) I did. And I have to remember when it's really hard, when I get more and more no's that the yeses that I got were ones that I didn't even dream of. And that they, that like you almost can, you almost have to be like, how are you? You can't get upset about the fact you got in the room. Like you got in the room that you never thought you were going to get into. And this still happens. I had a meeting with my number one production company that I want to work with, one of the best in the world right now. And they immediately took my pitch and they loved me and they loved my pitch and it just wasn't a right fit. And I was a little bit sad, but I was more overwhelmed with the fact that I can't believe I got to pitch to them. My relationship with my younger self and the way that that manifests is... I've always believed that when people are struggling with figuring out what it is that they want to do, I love how Elizabeth Gilbert says she doesn't really believe in following passions. She believes in following curiosity. Curiosity. And I really, really, really like live by that. And I do think that when you're really young, you have these things that you still really enjoy doing that still find ways to manifest. I ask my mom every once in a while to tell me about the things that I used to do as a kid. I all of a sudden during COVID, decided when theaters, like when local theaters uh, open back up, I'm going to join the theater. I'm going to join the community theater. I don't care if any, no one ever knows that I joined the community theater, but I think that that's something I want to do. And I asked my mom if that was something that I was interested in as a kid, like where did this come from? And she said, yes. And so I'm trying to like tap into that, even if it's just as a hobby, because I think it's really important to have a relationship with that person. And I don't believe that that person is gone. I don't believe my younger self is gone. And maybe according to, I think that this is a psychology type thing. I'm not a psychologist, obviously. I'm just like a really big imagination person. But if we believe that, you know, time is a social construct and we believe that the things that have happened to you, you can still heal from like your past, then I believe that if I I can go back in time and I've done EMDR therapy, which is kind of where some of this comes from, But if I can go back in time and heal different versions of myself, it's almost like a domino effect. It can really like lift these huge burdens and change my mind in ways that I didn't think were possible. I remember as a teenager, I also didn't really think, it's funny that you wrote this book the way that you did because I remember thinking in my head, I don't know if anybody can ever change my mind. I love collecting stories. I love learning so much, but like, And it wouldn't come out of nowhere. It would come in a moment where my mind was changed. And I would ask myself, I wonder if this is the last time my mind is going to change. And I think I asked myself that because it felt like such a big deal. Like when, when you have a truth that you believed in and then it shifts and it shifts and it shifts and you grow and you evolve. And it's almost, it's almost scary because this is really personal, but I'm noticing the more that I do this, the more that I change my mind, the more that I heal those past versions of myself, the harder it is to come back to certain friendships and relationships that you have 
because you're not the same person, especially because of COVID, you've been so far away from people. And now as we are, you know, fully vaccinated and starting to see people or reconnect with people, it's just like a little jarring almost because I'm like, do you still know me? Because I don't think you do, you know? I do know. Oh, there's, there's so much there. I think the first, I mean, the first thing it reminds me of is I, I had the hardest time for a long time with a few friendships where when, when we would get together to catch up, that's all we would do. We would catch up. We would reminisce old ex- about old experiences mm-hmm. and we weren't creating new experiences together. And at some point, wait, this, this friendship is just reliving the past. Uh, it's not actually moving forward in the future. And then there's the question of, well, I, am I holding that back? Is the other person, is it something about the connection between us? And I think that's just incredibly complicated. Um, the other thing that, that you reminded me of when you were talking is it's, it's such a travesty that, that you had to face so much prejudice and discrimination in order to land on this different path, right? In an ideal version of the world, um, you you would have just chosen it as opposed to feeling like you were yeah. you were forced. I will say to the build. originals played a really big role in that too. Thank you. Uh oh. Well, I I hope I hope it didn't ruin your career. No, it was uh, in the best way possible. It became like a manual that anybody we worked with had to read because we had to tell them like you you gave us the affirmation that what we were doing was the right thing and not just going into an abyss with with complete uncertainty. Well, that is wonderful to hear, especially about the book that I failed to celebrate. <laughs> it's great to know that it <laughs> I did it for you, someone. no worries. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You can you can do all my book celebrations from Got now you. on. Hi there. If you find our work beneficial and you want to support how we build our company at your service, you can subscribe to my Patreon at patreon.com slash nor. It's usually personal writings, and as I build a community on there, hopefully more. Your support is how we build. I also curate a weekly newsletter of all the things I'm benefiting from and enjoying that week. Anything from what I'm reading, watching, listening, buying, and more. Like most things, I keep it personal. You can subscribe to it at nortagori.com slash newsletter. Now back to the story. As, as you do start to achieve some of your goals, right? And then they start to become things that you expected. I found that sometimes it's helpful to decouple my aspirations from my expectations. To say, look, you know what? I do want to keep raising the bar. I do want to have more ambitious goals because when I achieve something, um, it, you know, it means I've, you know, I've gained more mastery or um, you know, more doors have opened, right? And, and I can start aim- aiming higher and I should be doing that, right? That's, that's one way to avoid resting on your laurels and being complacent. Uh, it's, you know, it's also a way to keep challenging yourself and growing. Um, and the thing to be careful about is to not assume I'm always going to hit those goals, right? To raise the bar for what I want to accomplish, but sort of keep the bar where it was on what I expect to accomplish. And that way, you know, if I hit, if I hit the higher goal, it's, it's almost a pleasant surprise and it's exciting. Uh, and if I don't, <laughs> like, okay, this still went pretty well and I met my expectations. Uh, and it seems a little bit more realistic. And I think the, the reason that I've, I guess that I've been rethinking this relationship between aspirations and expectations is that if the expectations go up with the aspirations, it's sort of a lose-lose. Uh, because if you succeed, uh, you're, you're, it's basically just like, yeah, eh, whatever. And if you fail, it's hugely disappointing. And if, it, if that happens too many times, you stop raising the bar. You're like, oh, well, I don't, I don't want to miss. I don't want to fail. I don't want to fall short. And so this idea of saying, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the aspirations go up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be increasingly ambitious, um, but my expectations are going to rise more slowly is a way to keep myself, um, you know, sort of, I guess, pushing myself and stretching myself, but, uh, but not, you know, just completely undermining the experience of, of goal pursuit and then success or failure. Definitely. One of my spiritual teachers actually taught me expectations are premeditated resentment. And I have to (laughs) check myself, yeah, almost every single day because I am an expectations person. I mean, I set goals. I I make schedules that are minute by minute from 304 to 307. This is what I'm going to do. This That's how I work. And that's how my brain feels like it can get things. I never get every single thing done. But 
the fa- like the habit and the work of just even evolving my schedule throughout the day to remind myself that I'm getting things done is kind of it's a way to alleviate my anxiety, I think. But and I'm replacing the word but for and every single time, and it's making me a lot happier. And I'm but. realizing <laughs> <laughs> I'm realizing that um we really do set ourselves up to not only resent ourselves, but resent other people. Even when the expectations that we're setting are not clear, we're not vocalizing the expectations. It's like expecting people to read our minds. Like, I thought that you, I, I assumed that you would feel this way, but it's really them projecting their own insecurities onto, onto you, but then taking it out on you when you're not responding. I'm realizing more and more that this type of insecurity is really selfish, even though it's uh, in the name of being, some, of being caring. And a lot of things that we do in the name of caring for someone or loving, for, loving someone is actually really selfish because you're putting your own emotions and anxiety onto other people and you're assuming that they're not a human being with their own stuff as well. That's uh, such a common problem. Uh, I, one of the places I've seen it in, in my work on generosity is uh, people, people end up in this, this trap where they say, okay, uh, I am, I, I'm just thinking of an example of this that, uh, that I've it's just been extremely frustrating. Um, I actually, I had a student this fall who, who came to me with a big dilemma. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm really having a hard time setting some boundaries in my life and i feel like i'm you know i'm not doing enough for other people but i'm also getting way overextended Mm. what's going on tell me more and he said well you know i um i started volunteering i i got a a coveted job and then i started volunteering to help people who are going for internships at that company uh prepare and you know learn about the interview process and i said well why are you doing that he said, well, you know, I, I believe in paying it forward. And there were a lot of people who helped me. And I feel a lot of empathy for, you know, the, I'm a senior and these poor juniors are all they're anxious and they're stressed out and I can help them. And I said, Kareem, let me, let me just, let me take a step back here and ask you, what good are you actually doing? You're, if anything, you're giving some students an unfair advantage, right? By giving them an inside view of the interview process. And if you didn't do that, it's possible that other stressed out, anxious students would have more of a level playing field and get the job. So why are you helping them? He said, well, because I know them and I, you know, I feel a little bit of their suffering. Okay, so are you doing this because you care about them and you really believe this is the best way to help them? Or are you doing it to try to make yourself feel a little bit better in this situation and feel like you've, you know, you've alleviated their pain, even though you're not actually, you know, net helping anybody. Um, you're just shuffling, right? Who gets the job and who doesn't if, if you're successful. And I've had this experience so many times where I've, you know, I've, I've put all this pressure on myself to help people. And then I've, I've asked, I have, I've had to step back and ask, am I actually doing good here? Uh, or do I just want the person to like me? And I, I think that's, that's so much of what's, what's driving in, in the Kareem example, right? He's, he has these students who, if he says no to them, He's going to think, oh, no, I'm jeopardizing the relationship. I'm hurting their feelings. They're not going to want to be my friend anymore. I'm, you know, I'm maybe destroying my network. Like, Aha. So are you really there to help them? Maybe not. He's still making it about himself. So many people who do things in the name of wanting to help and caring for I, I just, I just really care about this person. I'm just really concerned. You're still making it about yourself. One of my friends, actually, she's a trauma expert, and she taught me this, which I I'm always so stuck on where it's more important to let someone fail and figure it out on their own than to help them. And I I said to her, we were talking, the example was her and her sister working out together. And And I said, but what if your sister was going to physically hurt herself? And she said, it's more important that I listen to her and like respect her feelings and let her hurt herself so she can learn something on her own than it is to interject and try to like save someone. And I, and I just, everything shattered in my brain because I thought, you know, when you see someone 
who's about to fail, I, maybe it's your job to go in and save them and, and to help them. But maybe you're doing them a disservice from not learning the lesson yeah. that they need to learn and not letting them yeah. grow and ask for help the way they need to. Yeah, that <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of the white knight syndrome, right? Which is, I want to rush in and come to the rescue and be the hero in this situation, as opposed to asking what's really going to serve the other person best Definitely. in the long run. Another thing I really like about your book is the cover art and the cover design. And I hear a really up and coming creative visionary to the creative direction for your art, your cover art, which is a lit match. But instead of fire, the match that is lit is lit of water. Tell me about this person and what they meant by this story. <laughs> well, we, we had a hard time coming up with a cover concept for this book. and. I, I'm not a fan of judging a book by a cover in general, right? There are great books with terrible covers out there. I do think if you see an amazing cover, it usually means there's a creative team that put a lot of energy and passion into coming up with something that would represent the book. And maybe, maybe you, could, you could give a book with a great cover an extra chance, right? But don't judge a book for a bad cover. So it's always been important to me to make sure that, you know, that the cover captures the reader's attention and says something about the book and how do you capture thinking again? It's something that happens inside your head and we tried optical illusions and some of them were just cliched and others you actually couldn't understand what they were supposed to be saying and uh, we were just, we were at a loss and I happened to say to our oldest, uh, our oldest daughter, Joanna, who's 12, uh, that we were stuck on the covers. And she came to me about an hour later and said, I have an idea. What if you had a candle or a match with fire, but water instead? Oh my gosh, that's a really interesting idea. And then she, she actually created a, a mock-up of what the image would look like. And I loved it. It immediately made, made me think again. I sent it to the team. They loved it. And then they created their design version of it. And that became the book cover. This is my favorite part of Think Again, is that I had to rethink where creative ideas came from. It would have never occurred to me before that to go to our 12-year-old, right, and say, can you come up with a book cover concept for me? Telling you, the younger versions. The younger versions are the geniuses. There it is. Although it's I couldn't have done that at 12. So sometimes <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, a more creative person She's who also, also happens to be younger. She's also your 12-year-old. So, like. Uh, no, I give my wife Allison all the, you all the creative Allison's credit You and Allison's 12-year-old, yeah. I mean, just brilliant. I asked this question and I wanted you to share this story because actually the originals, the reason that I bought it. Because I read the originals before I read Give, Give and Take. And the reason I bought it was because this cover was just so amazing. It was literally the last time I went into a bookstore and I just bought a bunch of books because of the covers that I liked. And yours happened to be the one that I read first. It may, it may have been the only one I read, actually. Um, <laughs> and look where we are now. Amazing. I, yeah, that, that's actually a great example of judging a book positively by its cover. And then, of course, you have to update and rethink your judgment once you read it and decide if it was any good. But I, 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 one of the things that I did not think about going in was the, a book in many ways is an invitation into the mind of an author. And the cover is, that's, that's the envelope, right? That's like when you get a wedding invitation, there's a, there's a first impression that you have of it. And I think a book is very much the same way. And too many, too many authors sit down and say, if I just get the words right, right? If, I, if I capture my ideas and I tell my stories, then, you know, then my work is done. And I think that, <laughs> no, you need to think about how you package the invitation too, uh, so that people aren't just excited to engage with your ideas and take a trip in your brain. Uh, they also are doing it with the, with the right frame of mind. Yeah, I, it's just finishing the body of work and making sure that you're putting the same amount of importance into every single aspect of it. It's fantastic. I hope Joanna grows up to do all of the book covers, all of the ad and gray. It's a family collaboration. Me too. She's, she started doing some cover design for other authors and has made a couple of book trailers too. And it's just, it's amazing to see her finding this creative outlet, which the pandemic could not have been a better time for it. Wow. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. I will be the first person, maybe the second person after you and Allison to buy one of her books because of the cover, because that's what I do. I judge them by the covers. We're ready. Bring it on. <laughs> In this whole process, 
what was the biggest thing that you changed your mind about? There were a lot of things. Uh, I think the biggest thing that I changed my mind about was uh, about how to have charged conversations. Ooh. I, g- going into writing Think Again, I was convinced that the reason we're so polarized is because people only see their own side. And what we need to do is show them the other side. I now believe that that's not only failing to solve the problem, it's actually part of the problem. Uh, it's, it's exacerbating the problem. And the, the research on this is, is pretty extensive and, and very robust. It's on our, our tendency as humans to fall victim to binary bias, where we take this whole complex spectrum of views and attitudes, and we tend to dumb it down and oversimplify it into two categories, which you know, helps us sort of, I don't know, find our footing in a, in a confusing world. And so if you take somebody who has an extreme stance on any issue, whether it's abortion or climate change, and you show them the other extreme, <laughs> that just reinforces the tendency to believe that there are only two positions. And which one are they going to like better? The one that they're already invested in or the one that sounds crazy and wrong and evil to them? Uh, and most people obviously will choose their own side. What we need to do is get people out of these binaries. And anytime somebody says, well, you know, it's us versus them, or, well, let me show you the other side. What I want to know is, what does the third angle look like? What's the fourth perspective that's missing? What we want to do is complexify the conversation and show the spectrum, the shades of gray, right? All the nuances between the positions and say, okay, you know, instead of just these two extremes, actually, some people who agree with you on one piece of that issue disagree with you on another piece of it. And there's a whole bunch of different camps. So Climate change is a, a clear example, right? Um, the media mostly covers people who are alarmed about a burning planet um, or who are completely dismissive of the fact that climate change is even happening. And what about all the people in the middle? Turns out most people are somewhere in the middle. Um, many people are concerned but not alarmed. Uh, they think, you know what? There's a lot of evidence that climate change is happening. It might not be good. Um, I don't know that it's an immediate emergency, and I'm also not sure what to do about it. And then there are also many people who are skeptical saying, well, I don't know that it's totally settled yet what's, um, you know, what what exactly is the biggest cause of it and, um, you know, when and what we should do to act on it. And when you amplify those views, you take the people who are, you know, denying science right on one extreme and and give them an opportunity to identify with one of those camps that's more middle of the road, which is part of, you know, opening their minds to science. Right. So that was probably the biggest rethinking I did while writing the book. I mean, that's something that sounds like you can continuously be rethinking that. It feels like there's so many layers to it because people who hold those really strong values oftentimes will feel like they're compromising on their values and that there's something wrong with them or that they're betraying some value that they have when doing it. It's like how we have a two-party system in America. We only have Democrats and Republicans. but I. You know, I want to bet that most people in this country don't agree with every single thing that their personal party does. Yet we are we are living in the on this binary and we haven't we don't even give people really room or permission to explore other options or to say I like a little bit here, I like a little bit there because the other side is always evil. And this happens also more intimately within our own community. So we we can talk about these ends of the spectrum but One thing that you taught me was this concept of horizontal hostility, which I had experienced so much, but I didn't have the language for, which is experiencing uh, distaste or hostility within with people who share the same values as you are, who are part of your community. The the example that I always give, which is one that you wrote about, is the research that was done on vegans having more hostility towards vegetarians than non-vegetarians, because if you're a vegetarian, then just go all of the way. And I think that that's the most clear one I can do. So I apologize to the vegan community, but that's the most clear example. Because my, my experience with that as a Muslim woman is you're talking about this or you did an interview in Playboy. What are you thinking? Like that hostility and that level of hostility honestly has allowed me to build my own community, but not feel like I can entirely be a part of the bigger one, which is rooted in trauma. But at the same time, and at the same time, kind of comes down to this thing where even when even when there can be two extremes on the spectrum and I, and it, and I'm talking about this cuz I'm visualizing it what about when the two middles seem so far away yeah 
Yeah, well, let's let's start with uh, vegans. I was riveted by Judith White's research on horizontal hostility, and she found that a lot of vegans do dislike vegetarians more than meat eaters, which doesn't make any sense because vegetarians are much closer to their values and their beliefs than meat eaters are. But the the vegans would say, well, at least the meat eaters are consistent, right? They're they're not hypocrites, whereas the vegetarians are, you know, are sort of they're 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 letting me down, they're violating my principles, and you know, this is really bad. They're like, a, they're a threat to our group uh, because they're, you know, they're not, they're not clearly distinct enough from the meat eaters. And I think that people do this in so many different walks of life. Um, Judith has, has studied it in a whole bunch of different places. Uh, she sees it with, you know, in political parties uh, where people will often dislike the more moderate version of their views more than they dislike the, the opposing side, so to speak. Um, same for religious groups, um, you know, extreme religious conservatives sometimes harbor more hostility toward moderates uh, than they do people who are atheists. Uh, and what's what's so surprising to me about that is uh, what Freud called the narcissism of small differences, right? That if, if you were to actually take a step back, if you're a vegan, right, vegetarians are a pretty helpful potential ally for you in your war on meat, right? There are there are a lot more vegetarians than there are vegans, I think. Um, there are you know, people who do sit in that middle position and could maybe draw some of the meat eaters over. Um, and it's a step toward you know, doing, uh, it's a step toward less animal cruelty, if that's your concern. It's a step toward less violation of your religious precepts, right? If, if this is a moral issue for you. And yet <laughs> you're like cutting off your nose to spite your own face. Like, nope, these people are not exactly consistent with my principles. Therefore, I can't ally with them. I cannot, you know, have any kind of allegiance with them. They must be taken down. Definitely. The same teacher that I told you mentioned the expectations are premeditated resentment, resentment taught me also this concept of the public minimum, private maximum. So the private maximum is how you choose to practice something. So if we're talking about religion, which is kind of my experience, how I choose to be a Muslim uh, at home and in my private life. And the public minimum is what is the very, 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 very minimum that it takes to call yourself a Muslim. And in our faith, the very minimum is believing in one God. That's the, the, the saying and believing in, in the last messenger of God. That's it. You can say that and not do anything else and you're still technically Muslim. But, if, but what happens is a lot of people impose their private maximum onto the public minimum and say, well, the way that I believe, the way that I practice, the way that I eat, whatever it might be, is the standard should be the public minimum. And that's just not right. And that also doesn't allow us to build or connect. And it makes people feel alienated and alone. That is such an insightful analysis. I think, I think it's right on target. And I think that one of the things that, <laughs> that, that we ought to do is say, okay, maybe, maybe we shouldn't always hold other people to the same standards that we hold ourselves. Uh, maybe, maybe sometimes we're being too hard on ourselves and you know, then we're, we're being too hard on other people. In other cases, uh, the standards you know, that, that we think are appropriate for us may not be appropriate for them. And I, I see a lot of people you know, land in this position where they're very critical of a public minimum uh, because they have a, you know, to, to your point, um, a much more strict private maximum in mind, but they're only evaluating that on one dimension. And they forget that life and values um, are multidimensional and that you might be quote unquote better than someone on the one, you know, the one aspect that you're comparing on, and then you might be falling short on others. Yep. And it's, it's sad to see I don't know. I've, I, I keep noticing that when, when you think about the people who help you set those standards, they're usually your role models. Uh, the, closer, the closer you are to them, the better you know them. Um, you know, the, it's, like, uh, it's like looking at um, a car in, in, your, um, in your passenger, uh, in your side mirror. Right? Like ob objects viewed through this mirror may be distorted. <laughs> um, yeah. That's true when they're, when they're at a distance, right? And the closer they get, the more you get to see them for real. And I think your role models are rarely as uniformly virtuous as you think they are from afar. 
Um, the same is true for your villains, right? That if you see them up close and personal, they are often like their vices are not quite as bad or they don't define them quite as much or as comprehensively as you think. And I think it's for me just a reminder that we could be, we could probably show a little more compassion to others and then also show ourselves a little more compassion too when we fall short of our own private maxima. Yes. And maybe if we were to look at people with that closer lens, whether it be our role models or our villains, we will have more empathy for them and have more empathy for ourselves. And that would be the, nice. <laughs> yeah, right? The thing I always go back to is that you will have a whole lifetime to work on yourself. Like you should not have time in your life to be focused on the business of other people because there's just too much for you to do. And I, that's how I think about it. That's why I strongly, strongly, strongly dislike gossiping. It makes me feel really uncomfortable, but also – seems like one of the biggest wastes of time. And I know that some people enjoy doing it, whether it's harmless or not. I just have so much to do. And so I'd rather just sit down and talk to you about ideas and see you for you. And I love getting to know people that up close and personal because it reminds me that I can be me too. And I can be me and not worry about fitting any other standard because that's what we should be expecting from ourselves. I generally agree with that. I wonder about one exception in the spirit of oh, tell me. inviting people to rethink things. Uh, the, the work that really shifted my thinking on this is Matthew Feinberg and Rob Willer on what they call pro-social gossip, which is essentially warning people about the selfish behavior of somebody that they don't know well. Uh, so I, I saw this in the context of the research I was doing on givers and takers and matchers, uh, where you know, the, if, if you're a, a highly generous giver, um, you are sometimes vulnerable to being taken advantage of by the most selfish takers. Mm -hmm. And there, there are these people in the middle of that spectrum, um, again, the middle being most common, um, the people who I've called matchers, whose default instinct is to try to maintain justice and preserve fairness and say, look, givers ought to be rewarded and takers ought to be punished. And one of the ways that matchers protected givers against takers is they would say, hey, Nora, don't trust this guy. He's a selfish jerk. Right. Definitely. And they'd, they'd warn you about somebody's history or reputation of, of manipulative behavior or toxicity. And I started to believe that that serves an important function in the world. And that if, if pro social gossip doesn't occur, then the people who are most trusting are the most vulnerable to exploitation. What do you think of that? I'm not going to, it's not something I can even challenge because my faith, in my faith, it literally says gossip is only permitted when you're protecting someone from someone else. Oh, and when you're well, that, looking out for someone, which is literally clear. My... <laughs> so to yeah. me, wow. that, that's I amazing. Even... <laughs> I don't even know if I consider that gossip because I think that gossip to me is talking about people, other people's secrets or putting other people down. But you know what? I'm so pro. What did you call it? Social? Pro-social gossip. Pro-social but... gossip. Yeah. All day. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, that, uh, the definition covers you beautifully. I think the, the place it gets tricky is. I think where it does become gossip is something that I've done a few times in part because other people did it for me. I've said, you know what? I don't know this person well, but I, my spidey sense is tingling. Like there oh, have been totally. a couple, there's been, there've been a couple of red flags and then I can't, I can't verify that they're, that they're takers, right? I don't know for sure that they're selfish people, but I'm just kind of warning, be a little cautious, right? Maybe, maybe help them a little uh, before you, you know, you make yourself too vulnerable to them. And in that sense, I, it feels like a bit of gossip to me, but it's still done in service of protecting mm. somebody. So I think it, it, still, it still qualifies as, as acceptable in your view, right? Oh, definitely. Because that's coming from intuition, which I think is even more divine than just our common sense. That, is, that has always been my guide. And it's always proven to be true when I have that feeling about someone or something or an experience. You know, a crazy story one time, when I was, when I first started speaking, I've been speaking since I was 17, like touring and speaking. I got invited to this event that was in Pennsylvania. It was promoted as, as this really big event. I got the biggest speaking fee that I had ever gotten at the time. And everybody that I know was getting invited. Something in my, something in me just felt like something was off. I've actually never shared this story before, even when it happened, but something in me was totally off. And the way that the, organizer was talking. I just felt, I just felt off. So I pulled out of the event. 
I was the only person to pull out of the event. And wow. a, everybody kept asking, why did you pull out? Why did you pull out? And my answer was, I just don't have a really good feeling. I'm not going to, I don't know what's going to happen. I just don't have a good feeling about it. The event comes around. People flew in from Europe to do this event. They all show up to the venue. This isn't Firefest, is it? No, it's not Firefest, but it's basically <laughs> it like, like Firefest. No, well, yeah, but it, but it is one of those stories. Everybody showed up and no one was there. The woman had taken all of the money from the register and like the registers and all of that. And people were stranded. They had to get people to like help pay for their tickets to go back home. And I was the only one to pull out, had no reason to pull out. I, it was the most money I had ever been offered before. And honestly, part of it was just, I've never been offered this much money and something feels wrong with this. And maybe this is my test to see if I'm going to do this because I love this this check, but it's just not right. And I wow. never, after that, anytime I have a feeling about something. So I kind of partook in what you were saying, but I didn't have any reason to, and I let other people make that decision for themselves because I'm not going to tell people what to do. But what is your relationship with your intuition? Do you always listen to it? No, definitely not. So I, I, I think this is so interesting. I, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with intuition because on the one hand, I recognize that there are those warning signals that you get and you can't always explain them and you really beat yourself up and regret later not listening to them. Um, I also know that there are times when our intuition leads us astray. And I, I, the way I would, I would explain that is when I think about intuition, I think about it as subconscious pattern recognition. Um, okay. It's, you know, it's a set of patterns that you picked up in the past that your subconscious mind can recognize more quickly. So you're a scientist. Um, yeah. I mean, this is, this is what I do, right? So, <laughs> But, you know, if you actually want to, if you wanted to measure, like, how is intuition being represented, right? It's like a, a standard example in research on intuition is you're a firefighter. You go into a burning building and all of a sudden you have a bad feeling about it and you dash out and a minute later the building explodes. And what happened there is your subconscious mind recognized a series of patterns in the way that the fire was spreading um, faster than you could have actually processed them, right? And connected it to the last time you saw a building explode. And, you know, that, that, that split second instinct to follow your intuition saves your life. Um, if you study, like crazy, right? Just stop there. Wait, that like, actually amazing. exists. That is yeah. scientific inside of our bodies. Gary Klein, um, I think, is probably the psychologist who's done the most interesting work on this. And he shows that firefighters, if they go on their intuition in a situation like that, they will make better decisions than if they actually stop and analyze it. Um, nurses also are sometimes able to diagnose illnesses in patients before they're visible on a medical test, um, in part because their intuition picks up a series of patterns and connects the dots and says, oh, that's what the diagnosis is. And you, if you stop there, follow your intuition. The problem is, there are actually two problems that, that I worry about. I'm very curious to hear your take on them. The first problem is that Intuition is not reliable if you're, in an environment, if you're in an environment that's different from the one that it was formed in. Uh, so the reason intuition works for firefighters is there only, uh, there, there's a limited number of ways that a building could burn, right? Or a building could explode. And so the conditions you've been exposed to for the last 10 years of your career are going to be repeated over and over again. Um, if you study stockbrokers trying to use their intuition, it's terrible because the market conditions that you built your intuition in are completely different from the conditions that you're applying it now. Um, you see this with venture capitalists too, or I, one of my favorite examples is Steve Jobs, who is so right with his intuition about software. And then he goes over to a different industry and bets on the segue and is convinced that, that that's story. gonna become a huge hit, right? Yeah, you remember yep. that from originals. And to me, that was a classic case of not realizing that the years he built up accurate intuition about software didn't apply to this hardware transportation um, you know, industry question that, he needed to gain more experience in to figure out, okay, what are the patterns that I can trust there? And so I guess that, that actually, it's one problem, not two. The problem is that some environments are more dynamic and unpredictable than others. And that means that uh, intuitions uh, sometimes get ported into places where they don't belong. And let me, let me give you the, a different example of this, and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up and let you react. I think where this really worries me is intuition is also responsible for a lot of bias and prejudice. Uh, I, um, right. I once had... I once had somebody not hired for a job 
because somebody said, you know, I, my intuition about him just, I, it, I didn't feel right. And I said, well, I don't, I don't believe in making hiring decisions that way. I think we should have criteria for the competencies and skills in the job. And then we should figure out whether this person has the motivation and the ability to master this job. And finally I pushed and it turned out that, um, you know, the, per the manager just got a bad vibe. Well, guess what? The, the candidate was autistic. And, you know, there's something about the, the social cues, um, the lack of eye contact, right? Some of the, the responses maybe not building the same level of rapport that they were used to that led to this, this episode of discrimination. And in that case, right, the intuition was, well, this person is not socially skilled. And then that, that gets sort of overgeneralized into, therefore, they can't do this job. Um, and that, those are the kinds of situations where intuition really scares me because it allows people, we form intuitions that people who look like us, right, who come from our culture um, are, you know, are more trustworthy than people who belong to an outgroup. I'm like, I don't want people to follow those intuitions. I want them to challenge them. So what do you make of all that? Sorry, I said a lot of things. No, no, no. Why would you ever apologize? I'm just um, a little bit. I'm wrapping my, around about, around, wrapping my mind around what you said and also wrapping my mind around the fact that I've never had something like that challenged before and I've never had to think about this. And so... <laughs> Thank you for making me, quote, think again, unquote. Thank you for thanking me for <laughs> doing the thing that a lot of people find really annoying, which is saying, like, I wonder, I wonder if there are times to rethink that. Are you kidding? I, if, you could, if you could go back and analyze everything I just said and tell me where I should actually rethink things or challenge myself, I would really appreciate that because I don't really get the opportunity. But I don't know, right? I'm, but you I, that, pose that's that the question. You poke, you poke, you poke. Okay, so intuition. Yeah. First, you were talking about the environment, and I will say that I don't think I've ever really been in it. I don't think I've ever used intuition in an environment sense unless it's – not even unless it's because I'm thinking about experiences of sexual violence that I've gone through, and if – and back, and I didn't really have that intuition. That also may have – and that I didn't have that intuition, but that also may have been part of why I didn't even realize what it was until a lot later. And maybe intuition comes from having some type of knowledge and then your subconscious yeah. being able to do those patterns. No, I, I, I think that that captures it really well. And I think the, the Gary Klein, there's a whole debate between De Gary Klein, who was showing all these benefits of intuition for decision making, and then Danny Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize in part for showing the unreliability of, in, of intuition. And they were arguing for years and then finally said, Let's design some experiments together to reconcile our views. And they basically aligned on this idea that intuition is reliable in stable environments, but not in dynamic or unpredictable environments. And I think what's interesting about your, oh, your cool. observations about intuition is it sounds like you've learned a series of intuitions about people. That was what I was confident in until you said that thing about the bias. I wonder if, and this isn't just me trying to like size myself and just be really cool, but I'm hyper, hyper, hyper sensitive to the concept of bias. And that's because I went into journalism. I've, I've been in journalism for over 10 years. I studied journalism, but I was always taught about, I was taught objectivity and bias in a way that never felt right to me. So me having to be objective in my storytelling and pitching a story to my news director, who is a white man who doesn't know or have my experience. And I say, this is a really important story to tell. And he says, I just don't really understand it. I don't get the relevancy, blah, blah, blah. That is his own bias. And I think that so many of us, and this is kind of the reckoning that's happening in storytelling and media, we've internalized what it means to be objective. We've been shamed, fired, punished for inserting feelings or perspective on the stories and the coverage around our own communities. But how has the misrepresentation, for instance, of Muslim people pre and post 9-11 been considered objective? And Christian Amanpour says, never draw a false moral equivalence. And even then, you're still talking about morality and what people think is moral is different. But I think when there's a clear oppressor and an oppressed, 
then the situation should be de- like should be just as clear when the story is being told. So I've always asked myself before I go into a story, how is the way I cover this going to impact the people or the communities that we're talking about? Because I've known that the misrepresentation of Muslims has led to deaths in our community, to people that I actually know. And I'm really hyper aware of making sure that when I'm engaging with another person that I'm seeing them for them and what they say, how they treat, whatever it is. Like right now, I have really, really wild intuition about this person, this random person who technically could really help me in my career, but has, but has said things that feel familiar, that make me uncomfortable, that I know that this just isn't like the cons outweigh the benefits. And I know that I get a very physical, specific feeling when that happens. And, and you're right. I only really have intuition about my experiences with people directly in front of me. And, I, uh, and that, I'm I mean, comfortable that, with that. It almost sounds like a repeat of your speaking engagement story, right? Like yeah. the, the, the window dressing is very attractive, but you're like, mm, I might not like what's inside so much. Yeah. I'm going to think about this. If I do change my mind or experience it, I will let you know, because I, I really never did think about the environment part of the intuition. I'll talk to my dad. My dad is a doctor and a pathologist and medical examiner and see what, that, what he has to say about that. And also the bias part, I'm going to be more aware of that. So thank you. No, I, I think one of the things I take away from your description of how you approach journalism is that uh, when people are in positions of power, they need to be especially careful about what their intuitions are, uh, because those intuitions can, um, can have real impact on other people's lives. And maybe a, there, there's a concrete example of this that's far lower stakes than, um, you know, the the prejudice and um, and violence against Muslims, um, but that I think drives the point home in a in a very clear way, which is a few years ago I was in the Daily Show writers' room um, doing an episode of my work life podcast, and we were we were really interested in how they diversified the writers' room. Uh, you know, so many late night TV shows were written by white men, and here you have this you know not only Trevor Noah as the host, but you have this incredibly diverse cast of of writers, and. They said, well, what we did first is we, we followed the orchestra model of blind auditions. Uh, we took names and faces and identities off of packets, and we just had people read the writing of the candidates who were applying, not knowing who they were. And that way, we were able to stri- strip bias out of it. But we still mostly hired white men. How in the world could, ha- could that happen? What's going on here? And it turned out that the evaluators were still mostly white men in the early days. And their intuition was the material that, like, the, the intuitive, like, laugh reaction that they had um, was activated by jokes that were told by fellow white men. And all of a sudden they realized, oh, well, our intuitions are leading us, even when we don't know that this is a white man's joke, to favor the jokes written by white men. So we need to diversify our evaluators, not just blind the packets that are submitted. And then once they brought in managers who are not all white men to read the packets, all of a sudden, lo and behold, people found humor in stories that were submitted by black women and Asian men, right? And the list goes on and on. And then you start to get a much more diverse pool. And I, I think what one of the things I learned from that example was that, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's helpful to, <laughs> to surround yourself with people who have different intuitions. Uh, because they they force you Whoa. to question yours, and they test your intuition, and sometimes you'll follow it, and sometimes you'll choose to rethink it. And I that's one of the things that that I enjoy most about uh, about the work that I do is I get to meet a lot of really interesting people who have intuitions that are different from mine, and then you know, they react to my work, and they're like, "Wait a minute, that does not sit right with me." I'm like, hmm, maybe I well, should so rethink what my you, intuition was. How do you notice red flags in that situation? Because I guess you know. I have a really, really, really diverse, quote, uh, friend group. But at the end of the day, we all have like similar values, ways of thought, ways of like, we feel the same way. And naturally, people aren't gravitating towards spending time with people who don't really align that way. So yeah, how do you maintain, especially with friendship, how do you maintain that? (laughs) I don't know. I'll tell you what I did after I finished writing Think Again. I, as you know, I wrote about the value of having not only a support network, but a challenge network. 
a group of thoughtful critics who point out your blind spots and tell you what you should rethink. And I went to a bunch of my most thoughtful critics. Uh, they were generally people who were highly disagreeable givers, uh, who, who enjoyed conflict, but were doing it to help, who, who dished out tough love. And I said, hey, you may not know this, but I consider you a founding member of my challenge network. Then I had to explain what in the world a challenge <laughs> network was. And I said, look, I, I've not always taken your criticism well. Sometimes I've gotten defensive. Other times I've just been on a path. And it seemed like a distraction, so I, I dismissed it. But I've always valued the way that you push me to think differently and question my assumptions, and I know I need that. So if you ever hesitate to give me feedback because you're afraid you're going to hurt our relationship or you're going to hurt me, don't. The only way you can hurt me is by not telling me the truth. And I have gotten much better feedback <laughs> since I had those conversations. And I think... You know, How's your that, ego? All, I mean, my, my ego is... I think intact. Uh, I think, you know, actually in the, in the long run, I think it's, it's made me stronger because everybody has those moments where they wonder, like, are people just telling me what I want to hear? And, totally. you know, are there, like, are there people out there who, you know, said nice things to my face and then maybe were much more critical behind my back. And I think the more that you validate your challenge network, the more that you, you know, really are serious about opening that door to hearing criticism. Um, the less of those insecurities you have. And so I think it's, it's actually kind of stabilizing. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the storytelling session. I just wanted to share something with you. If you're looking for a good deed opportunity these days, my family has been working to alleviate local homelessness for over 10 years. We have a foundation called I See You. And we make care packages for people experiencing homelessness. We make family food bags with food staples and give out grocery gift cards to families in need and more. Everything is done by donation and 100% of the money goes towards community members in need. If you'd like to donate, you can through Venmo at at ISY Foundation or PayPal to contact at ISYFoundation.org. If you or someone you know is in need in the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area and could use our help, please DM on Instagram, ISY Foundation, or shoot us an email. Now back to our story. Not so rapid, rapid fire questions. First one, what's your favorite time of the day to write? Morning. How early? As soon as our kids leave for school. Ah, great. <laughs> Favorite setting to write in? My home office. What's so special about your home office? Nothing other than whenever I sit down in my chair, I write. <laughs> so it's a, it's a natural, it's like putting on your pajamas and then knowing, oh, I should brush my teeth. Sitting down in my desk is the same way. So the practice, the ritual of, of sitting down. Exactly. What do you do when you are in a creative rut? I usually call somebody who is extremely curious uh, and tell them what I'm stuck on. And then they ask me a bunch of questions and they either give me a great idea or they help me discover something that I was processing but hadn't figured out how to articulate yet. That's so great. Your go-to vacation. I don't have a go-to vacation. I In a really... dream life, if you had an unlimited time. Go to vacation. I, you know what? I really love skiing with our kids. Where do you go skiing? Um, we've gone to a, a few different places. Uh, the, the, like the Poconos are not far from here. So that's our default. Um, it's just to get in the car and drive there. And I didn't learn to ski until I was in my late 20s. And that's I'm, I haven't learned to ski yet. And I'm so excited to. Oh, it's time. It's time. It was so much fun to learn as an adult and then say, okay, I'm going to. Like, I'm going to teach our kids to do this, or at least, you know, they'll learn and then we'll ski together. It's become a great uh, shared activity. That's amazing. That's also where my parents went for their honeymoon. <laughs> Woo, good choice. Yes. What do you, what music do you listen to for joy? I'm pretty bad at listening to music. Sometimes I go months without listening to it and I don't even notice. What about uh, podcasts? It's... Oh, I mean, podcasts are easy. Um, my favorites include Invisibilia, Revisionist History, Where Should We Begin, uh, and Everything Happens. And there are a whole bunch of, other, of others that I listen to as well. No Stupid Questions, 
And uh, what else am I forgetting? No, there's a much longer list, but I'll pause there. There's a really cool one called Work Life. I think you might like it. I've, I've heard it a few times. I, I enjoy <laughs> making it. <laughs> the book that changed the way you think about something during quarantine. Uh, High Conflict by Amanda Ripley is a great read on how to have better arguments. And your favorite person to learn from? The new author I haven't discovered yet. And there's finally, no, there's nothing, nothing that makes my day more from a learning perspective than reading a book by someone I've never heard of and saying, wow, I want to read everything this person has ever thought. Who's the last person that you read that you felt that way about? Do you know? Probably Kate Murphy, who wrote You're Not Listening. I heard that was amazing. That's actually on my list of books to read. And Great finally, book. what do you know for sure? That there aren't very many things I know for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adam. How can we be of service to you these days? That's kind of you to ask. I will try not to make you regret it. Store you want people to support? I love independent bookstores. Whatever your favorite local store is, I'm a fan. Amazing. Thank you so much, Adam. And if you ever need a curious person to um, hear and ask you questions, I'm pretty good at that. That's kind of what I do for a living. It shows. This was an <laughs> utter delight. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed this storytelling session. For more Adam Grant, you can follow him on Twitter at Adam M. Grant or Instagram at Adam Grant or listen to his podcast, Work Life, on the TED channel. Please, please subscribe to Podcast Noir, rate and review. It is a great way to support and give me feedback. If you'd like to watch the video version of this podcast, it is up on YouTube or Facebook, both slash Noor. And to you, our listener, I want to thank you for your listen and support. I'd love to stay connected. Here are some ways I'm telling stories these days. You can text me if you are in the US or Canada. Yes, it is me, not a bot. I also text you intentional daily questions of the day. My number is 301 246-8894. You can follow us on social, on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube at Noor, and on Instagram at AYS. My Twitter, Snapchat, and Clubhouse is ntagori. This podcast is produced by the At Your Service team, Adam and I. It is produced and edited by Molly McKean, and the amazing music is composed by Portugal the Man. See you next week.